four brothers were having a pre-holiday meal in which they were sharing the ideas that they had come up with and the decisions they had made as far as Christmas purchases for their mother. Each of the brothers was very successful and very rich. And every year they prided themselves on outdoing one another in providing a gift for their mother who had raised them in very humble circumstances. The first brother said, <clears throat> he said, I, I've decided and I've already done it. I built mom a 5,000 square foot house. The second brother said, and I equipped that house with a movie theater complete with big screen and surround sound. The third brother said, I went to my Mercedes dealer friend. I bought her a car, had it shipped to her. The fourth brother said, We all know how mother loves the Bible, but as she's getting older, she cannot see like she used to. So I found a parrot, and this parrot has memorized the entire Bible. It cost me $500,000, but I purchased the parrot. I shipped it to mom with the instructions. All she has to do is is, is state a chapter, a book, chapter, and verse and that parrot will recite it. Well, Christmas came and went, and Mom sat down to write her thank you notes. She wrote, Milton, the house you built me is so huge. I live in only one room, but I have to clean the whole thing. (laughs) But thanks anyway. Marvin, you gave me an expensive theater with Dolby sound. It can hold 50 people, but all my friends are dead. And I've lost my hearing and nearly blind. I'll never use it. Thanks for the gesture. Marvin, you bought me a new car. I can't drive. I'm too old to travel. I have my groceries delivered. I've not even sat in it yet. But thanks anyway. Dearest Bob, you were the only son to have good sense to give me a gift which I could use. And I want to thank you. The chicken was terrific. (laughs) Sometimes it's hard to find the right gift. But today in our study of some of the promises of God, we find what has to be listed as the greatest gift ever given. And that is the gift of righteousness by faith. We're going to make our declaration now. If you're new to Oak Hills or new online, we do this every week when we study the promises of God. This Unshakable Hope series is inviting us to look at some of these great and precious promises. Now, we want to do this right. So sit up straight, put your shoulders back, fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope. Say it like you mean it because the devil himself is listening and we're going to scare him out of the room. You ready? We are building our lives on the promises of God because his word is unbreakable. Our hope is unshakable. We do not stand on the problems of life or the pain in life. We stand. Father, let us now just have a sense of your presence. We do our very best, Father, but our best is never enough. We find ourselves with questions we can't answer and problems we cannot solve. We want to fix everybody, and we only end up making things worse when we try. And yet, Father, we believe that there is a good God who oversees all the details of life. We believe that we're under the shelter of your wings and that we're in the protection of your providence. Would you please speak to our hearts today? Forgive our speaker. You know his sins are many. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, My name once appeared in the sports section of the newspaper. You had to search to find it. Four pages into the Tuesday edition, midway down the sheet at the end of an article about the Texas Open Golf Tournament, there was my name. All nine letters worth. It was a first for me. 
I've had my name in the paper on other occasions, sometimes for which I'm happy, sometimes for which I'm a bit embarrassed. But this was my first time in the sports section. Took me a four decades plus to make it, but I finally did. It was also my first sports award. I know that's hard for you to believe as you look at this physical specimen. I almost received a sports award in, in middle school at a track meet. Uh, I threw the discus and finished in seventh place. They gave awards to the top six. So I got close. But this was my first. Here's what happened. My friend Buddy was the director of golf at the golf course that hosted the annual PGA Texas Open Golf Tournament. He called one day and asked if I would like to participate in the annual Pro-Am Tournament. I told him I needed to think and pray about it, and I took three seconds, and I said yes. <laughs> the Pro-Am has a simple format. Each team has one professional and four amateurs. The best score of the amateur is what is recorded on the scorecard. In other words, even on the holes in which I stunk, which was, hmm, let me think, 17 out of 18, I received a great score. Imagine the joy of such a game. On the typical hole in which I would score an eight on a par four, and Buddy would score a three on a par four, my eight was forgotten and Buddy's birdie was remembered and I was given credit for Buddy's birdie simply by being on the right team. Christ has done the same for you. What my team did for me on the golf course, <clears throat> your Lord Jesus does for you every day of the week. Because of his performance, because of his work, you close your daily round with a perfect score. doesn't matter if you sprayed a few into the woods or shanked one into the water. What matters is you have aligned yourself with the right team. Better foursome has never existed. You, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the great promise of Scripture is you are made right. You are given a winning score simply because you have aligned yourself with the Trinity of heaven. This is the message that comes through one of the great and precious promises of Scripture from Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. People are counted as righteous. People are counted as righteous. Not because of their work. But because of their faith in God. The origins of this promise are found Lo and behold, in the book of Genesis, with one of the great characters of Scripture, a man by the name of Abraham. So let's start with God's declaration to Abraham. Yes, though this promise appears in the New Testament, it really first appeared in the Old Testament. Abraham initially appears on the pages of Scripture as Abram. You'll remember that he followed his father out of Ur into Haran, or on our maps, out of Turkey into Iraq. The father died and the family decamped, and Abram, eventually became known as Abraham, pursued the commandments of the Lord and ended up in Canaan. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and God will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. This covenant is noteworthy because of what God offers and what God required. He offered everything and he requested nothing. Unlike the covenant which came through Mount Sinai, which had stipulations, this first covenant that comes through Abraham is essentially an insanely jealous bequeathing of God. 
All Abraham had to do to receive it was believe. But not so easy. Remember, Abram had not seen what you and I have seen. He did not have the benefits of Scripture. He didn't know the stories of Peter's redemption or Paul's conversion, the empty tomb of Christ and the virgin birth of Christ. Those were mere distant dots on the horizon. Abram was told to believe. It's no wonder he came to be known as the father of faith or the faith because in the beginning that's all he had he certainly didn't have any evidence God told Abraham to go into Canaan well Canaan was already occupied by some bloodthirsty tyrants God told Abram that 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 he would have children that would that would continue his legacy throughout history well how could that be he had no children And Sarah was pushing 80, and she wasn't pushing a stroller. How could it be? He he had an occupied Canaan, an empty crib. So how could these promises happen? Abraham had a faith crisis. And God's response to that faith crisis was to come to him in a vision and give him another word. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And here it comes. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. How many of you know what credited means? If you pay off a credit card bill, You are credited by virtue of your money. You are credited your payment. The heavenly father credited Abram far greater, a gift far greater than a zero balance on a credit card bill. He credited him as righteous. He credited him as right standing before God. He took Abram's faith and he said, that's enough. That's all I desire is just that faith. Even though it's hesitant, even though it's, it wavers, I, I can take that and I will credit that faith as righteousness. Now, some find this idea a little hard to believe. This idea that, that faith is enough. Belief is enough. Surely there have to be some works. Surely there has to be some type of tangible gift on our part. Surely there has to be some money that we give. It's just too easy, some have said. One of those who said that initially was, of all people, the Apostle Paul. And so we move from the declaration of Abraham to the interpretation by Paul. We fast forward 12 centuries from the Old Testament days of Abram to the New Testament era of the apostles. And you find the apostle Paul discussing of all things the life of Abraham. Paul was fascinated with Abraham. He talks about Abraham more than anyone else except his discussions about Jesus Christ. He mentions Abraham 19 times in his 14 epistles. Abraham was Paul's poster child for salvation by faith. Remember, Paul was a Jew. He was speaking to Jews. He never, it was never his intent uh, to abandon his Hebrew heritage or urge Jewish people to, to disregard their Hebrew heritage. He just urged them to embrace the Hebrew Messiah. Paul cherished his Hebrew ancestry, but he simply refused to place his trust in his Hebrew ancestry for salvation. He found Abraham to be a model of salvation by faith. Here's what he says. We're back in Romans 4 where that promise was found. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, 
He had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So the Apostle Paul quotes the passage from the book of Genesis, and he uses that word credited. It was credited to him. He uses it here, and then he'll use it three more times in the next four verses. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. I'm going to read that verse again. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts. He contrasts two people. The one who does not work but trusts. Trust God. And what does God do? God justifies who? The ungodly, people like Max. Their faith is credited to them as righteousness. What happened to Abraham happens to us. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sins the Lord will never count against them. So here goes Paul talking about salvation by faith using of all people Abraham as his example. Very important to Paul is not just the person of Abraham, but the timeline of Abraham. That salvation by faith came to Abraham before Abraham did any works. Now prepare yourself for a paragraph that's a bit technical, but it's important. Paul says, under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith when he was still circumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness may be credited to them. And he then is also the father of the circumcised who are not only circumcised but also follow in the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. I know None of you are going to rush over to Hobby Lobby and take this passage and put it in a Hobby Lobby frame (laughs) and hang it up in your hallway. It's not one we read and say, oh, I was moved by that passage. I get that. This discussion of circumcision sounds odd to our Western ears. Here's what you do. Take the word circumcision and remove it and insert the phrase religious deeds. Religious deeds. Because circumcision to the Jew was the ultimate religious deed of initiation. It was the work you did in order to be included in the family of God. Now the argument of the Apostle Paul is Abraham was credited with righteousness through faith before any religious deed. In his case, circumcision, which he will say later came 13 years after this moment in which he was credited righteousness through faith. In other words, his works were a consequence, not a cause, of his salvation. His works were a consequence, not a cause, of his salvation. The motivating factor in his salvation was this faith that he had. It was a wavering faith. It was a struggling faith. It was a faith that needed reassurance, but it was enough faith. It was what Jesus would call a mustard seed faith. And God took that faith, that seed of faith, and that's what prompted the acceptance of Abraham into the family of God. In other words, God granted inheritance, spiritual inheritance to Abraham, not because of his piety, not because of his pedigree, but because of his faith. Now, this has huge ramifications for you and for me. Let's make that our final point. Ramification for us. If Abraham was saved apart from lineage and law, then what does that say for Gentiles like me and lawbreakers like me? I'm not of the bloodline of Abraham, nor have I kept the law to perfection. 
Does God have a place for people like me? The answer from Paul is a resounding yes. Therefore, the promise comes by faith as opposed to works. It comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be, here's a word to circle, guaranteed to all Abraham's offering. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. That's us. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. In other words, those who choose to put their faith in the God of Abraham through Jesus Christ are, in essence, incorporated, grafted in, and included in the family of God according to faith and not according to works. God's promise to Abraham was salvation by faith. God's promise to Paul was salvation by faith. God's promise to Max, God's promise to you is salvation by faith. Gone is the fear of falling short. Gone is the quest to feel right, do right, or know the correct information. Dissipated is the anxiety that comes with thinking, having done everything, well, I have done enough. And welcomed is that blessed guarantee is the word Paul uses. Guarantee that we are included in the family of God. Not because of our work, but because we have aligned ourselves with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I received a gift a few days ago. A gift of peanut butter. I received it from one of the ladies who attends one of our ladies' Bible classes. I was given the opportunity to say hello to the ladies in the ladies' Bible class on a Tuesday morning. And I explained to them it brought back memories of my first ministry position in Miami, Florida, which also had a ladies' Bible class on Tuesday morning. I found great fellowship in the ladies' Bible class in Miami, Florida. Here's the reason. I moved to Miami as a single guy. I left as a married guy. But for two out of the three years, I was single. I learned that the ladies in the ladies' Bible class loved to put on what they called potluck dinners. I do not know where that phrase came from. I don't think it has anything to do with marijuana or good fortune. But ask me where it comes from, I do not know. But I do know it has something to do with a feast, a meal in which everybody brings a plate and everybody eats from everybody else's plates. It's just a delight. I loved it because the church was full of southern ladies who liked to cook, and on their staff they had a single guy who loved to eat. So I would circle on my calendar all of their potluck Party. Some of them were at noon, some of them were in the evening. And I learned to make those potlucks my survival secret. I would eat as much as I could, store it kind of like a camel stores water, <laughs> and then I would tough it out until the next one came along. I came to understand that one of the expected protocols of a potluck dinner is that everybody brings something. Well, that proved problematic for me. I don't cook. And so every single time, I would find myself about an hour before the potluck thinking, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to bring something. And so my offering was always measly. One time I took a bag of potato chips. One time I made a half a dozen jelly sandwiches. One time I took a jar of peanut butter. The good news is it was crunchy. (laughs) The bad news is it was already open and half used. (laughs) And so I went into the banquet hall and there all the ladies were already gathered and husbands were there. It was quite a feast. And I looked at the table and there was all that good southern food. And I went up to the director and I presented my (laughs) half-eaten 
jar of peanut butter. And she looked at it and she said, come on in, Max. Come on in. And she took that peanut butter and she put it on the table. Surrounded by all the great food. Nobody knew who brought the peanut butter. It didn't have my name on it. She kept it a secret. Although I think people suspect it. <laughs> and she handed me a plate. And I began going down that row of food. That table of food. Mashed potatoes. Fried chicken. Pecan pie. Green beans. And I skipped the peanut butter. And because of my measly offering, even with my measly, paltry offering, still I was granted a place at the table. I have no reason to think the Apostle Paul ever attended a potluck dinner. But I think he would appreciate the application of the story. Sometimes we come to God with a faith, and to us it seems so wimpy. Not much. But he said, I don't need much. I'll take a peanut butter faith. I'll take a mustard seed faith. I'll take a faith that still struggles. I'll take a faith that doesn't have to have it all figured out yet. I'll take a faith that is less than robust. You just give me some faith. You just put your faith in me. You give me what you got. And I will credit that. I will write you a check. I'll make you an eternal deposit. I will download into you a place of righteousness to the point that when I see you, I will see my son, Jesus Christ. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we could become what? The righteousness of God. And all we bring is peanut butter. It feels like we ain't got much. For that reason, the real hero of salvation is not you and not me. On the day of judgment, when you and I are forgiven for all of our sins, not one of us is going to say, boy, look what I did. You're not. You are not. You're going to look at Jesus Christ and say, oh, Lord, look what you did. And we're going to look back over our lives and we're going to say, you know, it wasn't much. But what I had, I gave. I brought my faith. I brought my heart. And we're going to agree with the Apostle Paul who said, for we are saved by grace through faith, through believing, through trusting, not by works so that no one can boast. What a gift we have been given. Amen. What a gift we have been given. Thank you, Lord. And so my name appeared in the sports section of the newspaper. Big deal. But my name is written in the book of life. That's the big deal. And yours as well. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. In a world that seems to go bad, there's hope that is so good. Salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you. And during these brief days on this earth, may we stand on this promise. May this promise deliver us from fear of failure. May this promise cause us to rest deeply in the assurance of salvation. May this promise deliver us from the deceit of arrogance. May this promise cloak us, clothe us in humility and gratitude. Thank you. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people say.